Welcome to the fourth episode of the Cesura Guided Tour. The Cesura Guided Tour is a series of videos where I build Cesura, an iTunes-inspired music player for Apple platforms feature by feature. In this episode, I'll finally be implementing actual music playback. I'm going to guide you through the implementation of the following features. Initiating playback, transport controls, live metadata for the currently playing track, handling changes in the collection that could affect playback, and reflecting play and pause status in the toolbar and table. By the end of this episode, the main functionality implemented in the first version of Caesura will be complete. Please note that while this episode was recorded after the release of Caesura 2021.11.5, all code shown will reflect the state of the code base immediately following the implementation of the features covered in this video. Before we can actually start playing music, we need to introduce two new concepts to our application, collection queues and collection queue players. Collection queue is a class that handles taking in an array of track objects, much like the ones that are displayed by our collection view controller, and keeping tabs on which track is currently playing, as well as having logic for determining the next or previous track. Collection queue player is a class that takes in a collection queue and hooks it up to the AV Foundation Framework's AV Player class to concretely play music. Now, if you're familiar with the AV Foundation Framework for media playback on the Mac or on iOS, you may know about AV Queue Player. Judging by the name alone, it seems like it would save us a lot of work and a lot of code if we could use it, so why aren't we using it? AV Queue Player only allows you to skip forward in items. If your first track finishes playing and the queue player moves on to the second track, the first track's player item simply vanishes entirely from the queue player's scope. There's no method you can call to make it go back to the previous track. If you want to offer skipping to the previous track at all, you're going to need to write your own code for that anyway. It also has a somewhat clumsy interface for communicating changes in the playback queue. While it might be fine for small scale changes like an individual track being added or removed from a playlist, it falls on its face pretty quickly when dealing with significant queue changes, like changing the sort mode or inverting the sort order. These issues also get amplified when dealing with repeat modes or shuffled playlists. Really, AVQ Player seems like it was purpose-built to play a queue of interstitial video ads in an app, more so than it was designed for the playback of music playlists. So we're instead going to be using a regular old AV Player instance that handles a single player item at a time, and all of the queue playback mechanism around that is going to be our own. It gives us a lot more freedom in how we wrangle that queue without directly impacting playback, and it lets us defer decisions about what the previous or next track should be until the track finishes playing or until the user explicitly requests a change. Okay, let's start off with Collection Queue. Collection Queue is actually kind of a misnomer for this class. In reality, it holds onto three properties. Tracks, which is the ordered array of tracks in the currently playing collection. Current Track, which is an optional reference to the currently playing track. And Collection, which is the metadata for the currently playing collection. These are also all arguments for the default initializer. I'm throwing around the idea of renaming this class to Collection Playback Cursor, as it more accurately describes what this class is actually responsible for, keeping track of what the currently playing track is within a collection and deriving what the previous or next track should be. The collection queue has five methods, four of which we'll take a look at right now. We'll look at the other one later when talking about handling collection changes. The first pair are previous track and next track, which are methods that return the previous or next track based on the currently playing track in the collection. Quite simply, if a current track is playing, we find its index within the collection, and if it has one, we derive the previous or next index. Then we check if it's within the bounds of the array, and if it is, we return the corresponding track for that index. If we don't, we simply return nil. The second pair are move to previous track and move to next track, which simply sets the value of the current track property to the returned value of the previous track and next track methods respectively. So previous track and next track let you preview what the previous and next tracks are, and move to previous track and move to next track perform the action of moving to those tracks. Collection queue players, on the other hand, handle playing a collection of tracks being handled by a collection queue object by feeding those tracks individually to an AV player instance. It has two properties, the audio player property, which corresponds to the AV player instance, and the collection queue property, which corresponds to the currently playing collection queue. First, let's look at the isPlaying method, which returns a Boolean result. It determines if the queue player is playing by asking the AV player what rate it's playing at right now. If the rate is greater than zero, we can deduce that the player is currently playing. Next, let's look at play. First, if the audio player's current player item is nil, but the collection queue has a current track set, that means that the audio player hasn't been initialized for playback. In this case, we convert the track object stored in the current track property of the collection queue into an AV player item via the player item method we will look at in a little bit. 
We then subscribe to AV player item did play to end time notifications for this player item, which will handle transitioning to the next track when playback has been completed. We'll also send out a track change notification with the current track attached, which certain parts of the app will subscribe to in order to display track metadata as tracks change. Last in this conditional block, we replace the current item on the audio player with the newly created player item. Once we're out of those conditionals, we can also just resume the audio player playback by calling play on the AV player instance. Pause is much simpler. All it does is call pause on the AV player instance for now. Previous track does quite a bit. First, it stops observing did play to end notifications for the currently playing item. Next, it asks the collection queue to move to the previous track. We then fetch whatever the collection queue's new current track is, and if there is no track, we replace the current player item with nil and return. If the previous track, on the other hand, does exist, we convert it to a player item, subscribe to its did play to end notification, send out a track change notification, and replace the current player item with the newly created player item. Next track does the exact same thing, but simply calls move to next track on the collection queue instead of move to previous track. The player item method takes a track object and converts it to an AV player item instance. This just checks the track object to see if it has a file URL set, then converts it to a URL object instead of a string, makes sure it isn't nil, and then it uses that URL to initialize an AV player item, which we then return. Last but not least, we have the player item did play to end time method, which is called to handle the did play to end notifications that we subscribe to on the AV player item instances. The body of this method is basically identical to what the next track method does, with the addition of a call to the play method on the AV player instance so that the newly provided AV player item starts its playback automatically. That is the entirety of our music player class, so now we need to hook it up to the rest of the app. First, we're going to add an optional collection queue player property on our app delegate. We're storing the collection queue player on the app delegate since the player is global to the whole application and not specific to a given window instance. Then we're adding a playback initiated method on the app delegate. This method takes in three arguments. Tracks, which is the full array of track objects for the collection playback is being started in. Select playback from, which is the track object corresponding to the row that was double clicked in the table view to initiate playback and collection details, which is the source list item with the metadata for the collection that we're starting playback in. This method mainly does three things. First, we create a new collection queue from these arguments. Then, if a player currently exists, we tear it down. This means stopping playback if it's ongoing and setting the collection queue player property on the app delegate to nil. Finally, we initialize a new collection queue player with the newly created collection queue, store it in our app delegates collection queue player property, and start playback on the player. Binding this to the collection view controller's table view is a little strange. Unlike most other ways of interacting with the table view, which result in delegate methods being called, double clicks on table rows are handled via the target action pattern. Targets are the object on which you want a method to be called when an event happens, and actions are selectors, which are fancy strings corresponding to the name of the method you want to be called. This is a pattern you'll see all over the place in AppKit on views inheriting from NS control. So here in the view did appear method of our collection view controller, we define the double action, which is the action that occurs when a row is double clicked, as being the selector for table view double clicked, a method we'll define shortly. You may notice that I didn't explicitly set a target for the table view, and to be honest, I didn't really realize I had until I started making this video. So why does this still work? Well, the Mac and iOS UI frameworks have this thing called the responder chain. Basically, whichever control is trying to call an action asks itself if it has a method that matches the selector in our action. If it does, it calls it and it stops there. If it doesn't, it walks up to its owner and does the same and repeats it until it exhausts all owners. Owners aren't necessarily parent views, they can be the object responsible for the currently displayed view, like a view controller, which is this case here. I'm not entirely aware of the nuances about how the responder chain works, so I'm reluctant to make use of it in my own code, but I accidentally relied on it here and it seems to be working. Table view double clicked then looks at the table view's clicked row property to determine what the index was for the double clicked row, and then uses that index to look up the track object in the collection view controller's data array. Once we have that track object, we can call the app delegates playback initiated method to kick off playback. As you may remember, the Caesura main window toolbar contains items for previous track, play and pause, and next track. We can implement these as IB actions on the Caesura window controller, which are bound to their respective toolbar items in Interface Builder. 
Previous and Next are pretty straightforward. They access the collection queue player property on our app delegate and call the previous track and next track methods on the player directly. Play just has an additional if statement that checks to see if the player is currently playing, and if it is, it calls pause on the player instead of play, which is what's called if the player is not currently playing. Since we're already sending out track change notifications from the collection queue player, we can subscribe to these in the Caesura window controller's window did load method and call out to a method named track changed. From that method, we can unwrap the track that's attached to that notification, and we can set the window's title to the track name and the window's subtitle property to the concatenated values of the artist and the albums for the currently playing track. One issue quite a few apps with playlist-based playback have is not properly responding to changes in a playlist while playback is in progress. This is one of my pet peeves with the YouTube video player on mobile, for example. If I add or reorder videos in my watch later playlist while I'm watching a video in that playlist, it doesn't take those changes into account until after the next video starts playing, and if the currently playing video is the last one in the queue, it will simply end playback before it gets to that point. It's not great. So it's important to me that Caesura responds reliably to changes in the library and ordered playlists. One of the ways we can handle these changes is with the update tracks method on collection queue. Update tracks takes in an array of track objects as its argument, which corresponds to the newly mutated or refreshed list of tracks being played, sorted by whatever the current sort order is. If there's a current track set on this collection queue, we attempt to find an equivalent track object in the newly provided array of tracks. If we find one, we replace the value of current track with this newly found equivalent. This ensures that previous track and next track navigation will continue to work once we've changed the track's property. We need to be smart and handle things a little bit differently based on the collection type as well. If we're playing the library collection, we want to use the track ID to find a match, because there will only ever be one entry in the array per track ID. If we're playing an ordered playlist collection, the same track ID can show up multiple times in the playlist, so we want to use the playlist association ID property to find a match, which corresponds to the row in the ordered playlist track table that contains this particular occurrence of the track within the playlist. There is a scenario where you might not find a match. Let's say I'm currently playing a track called Inside, but I start typing the word outside into the keyword filter text field. Assuming all of the other metadata fields are blanked, the newly filtered connection will not contain inside. So what happens? The way it's currently programmed, inside will continue to play until it ends, and then assuming that the keyword filter text field's value hasn't changed, playback will simply stop. This is because we didn't change the current track property or mess with playback at all when no match was found. And then when the track ended and it came time for the collection queue to provide the next track, since the track wasn't found in the currently playing collection, it couldn't determine what the next track should be. On the other hand, if in the seconds before the track ends the keyword filter text field is emptied, the list of tracks will be reloaded. Because we didn't empty current track when we didn't find a match, that allows us to try and find a match for inside in the newly loaded array of tracks. And what do you know, it's in there. So we set current track to its new record within that array of tracks, and when the track ends, playback will seamlessly carry over to whatever the next track in that new array is. With one exception, Caesura only lets you modify one collection at a time, the currently focused one in the main window. This means we can easily tack on a call to update tracks whenever we refresh a collection in the main window that matches the currently playing collection's ID in both the reload library collection and reload ordered playlist collection methods of the collection view controller. One other scenario we need to handle is if you delete the currently playing track from the currently playing playlist or the library while it's playing. If you're deleting from library while music is playing, the remove from library menu item chosen method on collection view controller now checks if the currently playing track ID is equal to the track ID being deleted. If that's the case, we stop playback on the collection queue player instance. Within the remove from playlist menu item chosen method, we run a similar check, but also specifically verifying if the currently playing playlist ID corresponds to the playlist that the track is being deleted from. While preparing this video, I realized there is one unhandled scenario, and that's due to the exception that I mentioned earlier. Caesura only lets you modify one collection at a time, unless you're deleting from the library. If you delete an upcoming track in the currently playing playlist from the library entirely, that does not trigger a refresh of the currently playing playlist unless you manually switch back to that playlist, and therefore that track will play later even though that track is no longer a part of the user's library. 
I'm planning some architectural changes in the future that will detach the playlist reload behavior from whatever the currently selected collection in the main window is, and that should make it much easier to fix that bug and handle that scenario. I think we've got enough time in this week's episode to sneak in some functionality I originally planned to show off in episode 6 of the series, and that is reflecting play pause status in the toolbar and collection table view. First we're going to need a way for the different parts of the app to be notified of changes in the play pause status. To do this we've created two new notifications. The player started playing notification, which we're going to send from within the play method in the collection queue player, and the player stopped playing notification, which we're going to send from four different places. Within the pause method, in the previous track and next track methods if there is no previous or next track, and in the player item did play to end time method if there is no next track. For the toolbar items, specifically what we want to do here is toggle the icon being displayed on the play pause button. In the Cesura window controller, there is now an NS toolbar item outlet declared that points the play pause toolbar item so we can change its icon. We're going to want to switch between the play and pause icons when the play and pause status changes, so we'll subscribe to both notifications sent from the collection queue player in the window did load method. These we'll call the player started playing and player stopped playing methods. If the player started playing, we change the toolbar item image to NS touchbar pause template. And if the player stopped playing, we change it to NS touchbar play template. For the table view, I've added a new column that will hold the player pause symbol if a track is currently playing in the currently focused collection, or if that track is currently paused. To actually add the logic for this column, there's a new clause in the table view object value for table column method on the collection view controller, which handles our new column. This column has the collection play pause column identifier. This clause first checks if there is a currently playing collection, and if that currently playing collection according to the collection queue player matches the collection being displayed. If it is, then we check if the currently playing track according to the collection queue player matches the track whose row we are in the process of rendering. If that also matches, we then ask the collection queue player if audio is actively being played or not. If audio is playing, we return a filled right facing triangle glyph to display in the column. If audio is paused, we return two bar glyphs to display in the column. Otherwise, we simply return an empty string so that the column stays empty. Three events can cause visible changes in our new column. When the currently playing track changes, when the player starts playing, or when the player gets paused. For this, we'll subscribe to the three relevant notifications in the view did appear method and bind them to the track changed, player started playing, and player stopped playing methods. These methods simply call reload data on the table view. This causes the values displayed in the table to be recomputed, but without fetching a refresh data from the database. The one last thing to do is to block sorting on the play pause status column. For this, I added a pretty dumb if statement in table view did click table column that makes it so that nothing happens if the collection play pause column ends up being clicked. Before we go, let's take a look at a quick demo of all of this playback functionality. With the added functionality covered in this video, Cesura is now legitimately an app capable of music playback, whether from the user's library or from one of their playlists. It's not necessarily implemented in the most optimal way, but it does the job and it opens the door to more features and improvements down the line. On the next episode, I'll be adding in support for a configurable music library file location, which will allow me to keep my real music library separate from a development music library, finally completing the functionality that shipped in the first release of Cesura. See you then.